This session, Managing Expectations, is brought to us by ACI Jet, uh, CommuniQuest, and ADK Executive Search. So we appreciate uh, their support in sponsoring this session. A few housekeeping notes. Um, this session is going to go all the way till 12 o'clock. And then it's going to be lunch on your own, where we resume back at uh, 1 o'clock here uh, for the next session. Um, passed out those Beatles sign-in sheets. So here's something that I didn't explain, just because we were rushing getting stuff done. You most of you probably don't know the titles to all the songs, and so I'm going to ask, who knows the title to that song? Did anyone know it? Raise your hand high. So on the right-hand side of that sheet, it has name, title, position, and this is open, so if you see someone raising their hand, go up and talk to them, ask them their name, ask them the title of the song, and they'll be glad to share it with you. Um, it's a way to get uh, our members interacting with each other. So. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Bob Trimborn, and he's the moderator for this session. Thank you, Brett. Well, good morning. Uh, again, my name is Bob Trimborn. Um, I'm the moderator of the session, Managing Expectations. And if you've looked at our session descriptor, it, it basically tries to, to encapsulate or discuss really what expectations are all about. I mean, we have been managing expectations since the moment we became potty trained. Literally, your parents expected you after that to use the bathroom. And ever since then, we've been managing those expectations in ways that really are a part of our everyday existence. You expect the alarm clock to go off. You know, to get up in the morning to go to work, you expect your car to start. You know, it's, it's just a fundamental element of who we are as a person, as a species. So it's it's very important to really understand how to manage these expectations in the professional world that we're in. And sometimes when we don't live up to expectations, and when certain people don't live up to expectations, it can have a catastrophic effect on those around them. And, you know, I hate to be sensationalistic, but when Colby and his daughter and those seven people got on that helicopter to go to Thousand Oaks, California yesterday, they had expectations that they were going to get there okay. When that pilot, no one knows exactly what happened, but when that aircraft flew into the terrain and they all died, catastrophic to say the least. So what we do, how expectations affect our lives can be very, very important. And so how we treat these things, again, in our professional career, is so important to understand. And back to the best practices approach to managing expectations. We have a panel here that has literally over 100 years of airport management experience. They don't look that old, <laughs> but they have that experience. So what we're going to talk about today is how they approach expectations in their professional career. As you can see, Kevin Buman with the uh, director of airports for uh, San uh, Luis Obispo Airport. Excuse my tongue-tiedness here. And then we have uh, Kip Turner, who's the director of Ventura County Airports, and uh, Dean Schultz, who's with Reno Tahoe, who's the COO of that airport. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start off, they're going to discuss, you know, what they do, how they do it at work, and then once we're done with those introductions, then I'm going to pose a question to the panel about how they manage certain expectations within their professional career. And I really want this to be an interactive uh, almost like a workshop setting. So if you want to jump into this discussion, you're welcome to. We're not going to wait till the end and say whole questions to the end. But if, you want, if, you, if something happens or s the discussion goes down a certain path and you want clarification or you want to jump in and be part of the discussion, just put your hand up and the crew in the back will come over and give you a microphone and you can join in with us up here. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dean. Well, I think, you're, I think your numbers are a little on the low side since I probably make up half of that 100 years or <laughs> my, just myself. So anyways, um, thank you all very much for being here. We appreciate it. And uh, I want to start by managing your expectations a bit from a couple perspectives. One was I was kind of um, asked to jump in on this last minute. So I, you know, I, I will do my best. Um, Secondly, I, I, I want to point out that I, I am a smart person, but I'm certainly not the smartest person in this room or near or the smartest person on this panel, for that matter. And so um, 
I, you know, and then I've also been around a long time, as Bob pointed out, and uh, so I've seen a lot of things, but I haven't necessarily seen everything. So um, I think Gary mentioned it, uh, continuous learning. It, it's important to not think you know everything, no matter where you are in your career path and how long you've been doing it, because there's always new ways to do things, new ways to look at things. And so my next um, thing is, is to make sure that approach everything with an open mind. Um, make sure that, you know, just because you've been doing it that way, and I know we're going to talk more about this specifically and talk about examples, but, you know, in general, um, just because you've been doing something that way and it seems to have worked, look at, you know, always look at other ways of doing it, listen to other people, and, and seriously hear what they have to say and think it through before you make a decision. So I think I'll stop there and uh, I'll hand it over to Kevin. All right. Good morning, everyone. So I have my radio voice on today. Um, bit of a throat situation that seems to have started with tequila a few days ago, so I'm, I'll leave it at that. But uh, in any case, uh, I've been in the industry 17 years, have been in San Luis Obispo for six years, and so I'm going to attempt in my thoughts today to kind of share the, the dualities of both the air carrier uh, airport as well as the general aviation airport perspective on some of these issues. Because in some cases, they're exactly the same, and in, in other cases, I would say the approach uh, is different. So uh, we have two airports in our, in our system. We have a small GA airport in Pismo Beach and then San Luis Obispo, which uh, certainly has some air carrier operations, but at its heart and soul is a very busy GA airport. Good morning, Kip Turner. Uh, I think Dean does have most of that experience. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I started flying and working at airports in 1985, so I've been around a little while myself. I'm currently in Ventura. Um, we also have two airports. Uh, one is a 139 airport currently without service, but we're going to be changing that hopefully soon. And then the other is a very thriving and nice GA airport that we uh, are proud to uh, have and, and have a lot of op op opportunities and things going on from there, so we're excited about that. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking to you this morning, so thanks. Thanks, Kip. And uh, I didn't give you my background. For those of you that have never heard of me, I'm Bob Trimborn. Um, I started out in my career, actually started flying in 1965. And in 1983, I became the airport manager of the airport I learned to fly at. And so I, I was part of that airport for 10 and a half years, and it was fun to grow up at an airport and then become its airport manager. So I learned a lot, not only from the flying side of the house, but also from the management side of the house. I then went up to Reno Tahoe, or Reno, let's say Reno Stead, excuse me, and ran Reno Stead for three years. That's the home of the air races. Learned a lot about events up there. And then I left there in 1987, and I came back down to Southern California to work for the Santa Monica Airport, or at the Santa Monica Airport for the city of Santa Monica. And for 17 years, I uh, was the airport manager there. And that I learned a lot about expectations at that little airport. We had 500,000 people living within five miles of an airport. And so homes at 300 feet off the either end of the runway. So when someone took off, they literally flew right over the top of a house. And when they landed, they flew right over a house landing. So it was an interesting dynamic, to say the least. So we're going to start this discussion today uh, with the panel. You know, you've all experienced being hired into a very new position. And I'm going to talk to Kip first. Managing an airport, directing an airport, how did you manage your own expect expectations going into that new job? And what are your lessons learned? Kip? Thank you. Um, I've been very blessed in my career. I've been able to be at some really great airports. I came over to California from Colorado, where I had served as director at three other airports there over the years. Great state, just like California is. And uh, really, I've been fortunate to be at some really fun and some really great destination type airports. Before that, in the southeast, hence the accent a little bit. Um, I like to tell everybody I'm from New York City, but that just doesn't quite, quite buy over. But, um, so I've, I've been very fortunate. I've, I've, I've walked into some great airports, and I've done that here in Ventura County as well. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's the Ventura County Airports is a great system. Uh, my predecessor was a, a very good man, as you all know, before me. 
and uh, so the expectations can be tough to come in and manage. Um, and what I have found out uh, through my career of trying to go to different airports and being in different environments is to try to get the pulse a little bit before I start trying to understand what it is we're trying to set a game plan for. So one of the things that I do uh, or have done for the last two or three airports that I've been at particularly as I've grown over the years in my career is I go into an airport system and I first start out by spending a lot of time right off the bat with all of the leaders of the community, the I mean everybody you can think of, the city managers, the council members, the commissioners, the supervisors, the leadership of the organization of which is your sponsor, whether it's an authority and your board or your county and your, your city, whatever it may be that sponsors you. And then I stretch that out as far as I can to the industry organizations that are on the field, um, the heads of those organizations, the tenant organizations, and I just try to listen. I just try to go and I try to listen. I spend a couple of three months doing that at least. I set up as many one-on-one -on -one meetings as I can to try to just get their idea of what's going on, their visions of the airport, where they want to see the airport go, what they think the airport should be doing for our community, and, and so forth. And one of the things I found out by doing that, particularly the last <coughs> two or three airport systems I've been at, is I, I oftentimes in that process and I realize there's a lot of great ideas out there and there's a lot of great thoughts out there, but the leadership itself oftentimes does not even have a single voice about what they want to see those airports do. And that's so important because you can't as a team, as an airport staff, go out and execute without having a vision. Um, so I use a lot of sports analogies. I'm a sports fan, so I talk sports a lot. So I'll probably do that a lot in, in what we're doing this morning. So for me to come up with a game plan, if you will, I've got to figure out what the head coaches want, right? And then we're the coach of the organization. So we got to be able to execute. But uh, so doing that is, is that's the first step I do to set that up and get that game plan, so to speak. Then I carry that back to my, my immediate leadership. Um, my case, it's a county, so my immediate leadership is the CEO of the county of Ventura uh, in my current circumstance. And I relay back the summary of that two or three month exercise or however long it takes you. And, and then I try to find out if that's, if that's in association with the leadership's expectations of the airport or airports in our case. And then whatever comes out of that is based on what you just, what you just found out. So for example, in Ventura County, um, we, we saw the need to enter into a master plan and actually we're calling it a system plan. We're, we're looking at a master plan effort that's kicking off uh, end of March, 1st of April and it's going to encompass elements of both of our airports to try to get a unified vision for how we carry our two airports forward over the next 10 years or 15 years. And then we as staff go execute that game plan. So that's that's what I do when I go into an organization, and I don't know if that was the way to answer that question, but that's. <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about that time from when you um, say you're, you're moving from interested in a position to being offered a job and then the onboarding. And I think uh, I in a succinct way, probably the easiest way to say it, if, if, if you've ever heard the term confirmation bias, you might read it in aviation <coughs> accident reports, and it's, it's when the pilot expected to see something and thought they were seeing it um, and they proceeded to make decisions as if they were seeing it but it wasn't in fact true there was there was false indicators there and they weren't computing that properly and so I think as aviation professionals when you think about confirmation bias when we see things in an organization that we think to be true or that we think well it's this because of that is that really the case and so as, as uh, I became interested in the position at San Luis, I talked to as many people as I could. I picked up the phone, I called anyone I could think of who had information about the airport and the position to find out what's this all about. Tell me about the airport, where it's been, where it's going, and tried to gather as much information as I could to start to create that picture from a lot of different perspectives about the airport. And then day one shows up and you're, you're, uh, your first day on the job, well, you, you walk in with a baseline of information, but avoiding being um, biased because of that, remaining open to now I get to see this, this next evolution of my learning. I'm now a part of the team. 
Uh, I'm going to hear from those who are directly involved and really remaining unbiased in that approach to starting to understand the organization. You know, we walk in the door as an aviation professional and it's, it's pretty easy to have your own ideas and your own opinions about things, particularly as you get later in your career and you've seen a lot of things and, you know, I've seen that before. I know why that is the way it is. Well, do you really know that? And so you have to challenge yourself to, to hold back a bit and be willing to listen, be willing to understand, maybe slow the reaction down a little bit, and, and take in the full picture. And so uh, that served me well in the transition. You know, I came into an organization that was in a, a pretty dynamic state at the time with uh, a terminal program ready to start, growth on the horizon, a community that had, had seen the airport um, underperforming from an air service standpoint for a long time compared to what it historically had done. So, so expectations and frustration were rather high. And, uh, and how do you start to sort all that out? Uh, the, as you start to prioritize from that, you think about, well, is your energy immediately best spent fixing problems or taking things that are working and making them more successful? That's a really interesting process to go through when you look at, you know, any organization is going to have its challenges, its issues. And some of those can be incredibly difficult to improve or fix, but yet taking the things that are good or maybe average and making them really good and creating inertia and momentum out of that can be a hugely transformative process. So I'll end with that. <coughs> Mine's going to be very short. Um, <coughs> I, uh, in my introduction, I neglected to, to give a little bit of background on myself. Um, I, I started a long, long time ago, and I worked as a consultant for 13 years, and then I joined the uh, airport authority in Reno 23 years ago, so and it's the only airport that I've been at, and um, I could talk about a couple of successions that I've had within that organization, but uh, I haven't had to go out and, and start anew, if you will, uh, like these gentlemen have. And uh, so I think they, I think they nailed it. Um, it would be exactly the advice I would give, so I'm not going to repeat any of that. But uh, the one thing I, I will say is never forget the informal leaders within the organization. Um, there are the external leaders, there's the leaders of the organization, but there's a lot of very smart people in your organizations that have good ideas that may not have been listened to in the past. So again, be open-minded uh, to, to hearing from all levels. Um, and, and as they both said, have patience. You don't have to fix things uh, because things may not be broken. So you, you, know, you just gotta learn and seek to understand. The, and I'll give an example. We rotate board trustees every four years or thereabouts. And, and more often than not, they'll come in with a full head of steam on how they're going to fix it. I don't know why they think it's broken. It's not in the newspaper. There's no, no indication there's anything wrong. But somehow they ran on a platform or they've been told by somebody something's broken. And so my experience has been working with new trustees and new staff coming in and, and, and we follow a very similar process. We, we do a two-day orientation with them and uh, we truly sit down with them and try to get them to understand how things operate. So I'll stop there, but I thought, I thought Kip and um, Kevin did a really good job. Well, thank you, uh, Dean. Entering a new organization, I remember my first days going into an airport, um, three different airports. You, know, you think you have an idea of how the airport is going to function, but then you sit down that first day and, and you're all alone in your own office and you realize, you know, and you open a book and it says, this is how it really is. So your expectations kind of get changed by the culture of the existing airport, which leads me to the next question. So airports have like legacy expectations. In other words, let's say a, an airport director has been there for many, many years and built up this culture and his protocols and, and how he feels how the airport should operate and run and for years and years and years it was that way. Then you have someone new entering the organization, a new CEO or a new airport director and they come into, the into this, this established organization how do you deal with that, Dean? How did you deal with it with the various new leaders since you've been 23 years at one airport? 
you saw new leaders come and go all the time. Well, not all the time, but often. How did you deal with that? How did, what did you see? Um, I'm gonna say we've had some success and we've had some um, less than successful experience in that um, because we still have some folks, uh, our, our current CEO has been there for six and a half years, but however, we still have some staff that carry baggage from the past administration. And uh, so I don't know if it's, if it's us alone or if it's a thing that happens uh, everywhere, and, but uh, there's always gonna be some faction of, of culture that just aren't willing to accept change. And, uh, but, but what I will say to, to those to, to help with success is communication. <coughs> Just keep communicating the message, keep connecting the people and what they're doing uh, to what uh, Kip had talked about with what's the vision, uh, what is the, uh, the mission of the organization. Um, just keep communicating a consistent message as to how important each and every person in that organization is and how their job helps achieve the, the greater mission. So, um, like I said, we still have a, a few folks that just don't seem to be able to let things go, but, uh, you know, what we're, what we're shooting for is getting the vast majority on board, and that's how you change a culture, and it, it takes time, I will say. It takes a long time, so don't, don't think you can come in with one email or, or attend one all-employee meeting and, and convey what you think is the new vision. You have to keep repeating and repeating and repeating, and you have to send that message in different formats, verbally, written, uh, your actions. Actions always speak louder than words. So, you know, if you're gonna have a vision, live the vision and, and, and practice the vision. So I'll, uh, I'll pass it on from there. So I imagine any airport that one would walk in the door to is gonna have that legacy expectation. And, and you can look at that from a lot of different perspectives. What is the community's expectation of the airport, the users, the airlines, the tenants? There's, there's so many different facets to it. Um, I think it's important to understand how the airport uh, has institutionalized its, its engagement with those groups. Uh, do the actions match the words? We, we say we do this for our, for our tenants, um, and we, we see this action, but what, what do our founding guiding documents tell us we should be doing, and do they match? I think that's an important thing to understand. It doesn't have to match perfectly, but a healthy organization, I think, is gonna have some level of continuity between Here's the documents, the policies, the procedures, the strategic business plan, all these things that say, this is, this is where we're going, this is how we do business, this is why we exist, and then the actions that come out as a result of the effort of staff, and are those in alignment? And it, it will likely never be perfect, but they should be in a, a synchronization that is obvious. If they're, if they're wildly different, I think you're gonna find challenges immediately because people are gonna say, wow, you know, I, I see it says this, but you know, when I have this happen, it, it doesn't look like that at all. We had, as I mentioned, um, air service at our airport that when I got there was, was uh, still recovering from the recession. It had been recovering for a number of years, and, and yet by recovering, it wasn't growing. And so there was, there was a lot of frustration within the business and the tourism communities that you know, the airport wasn't the vital asset that it once was, that businesses were we're suffering because of that. Tourism couldn't grow in a county that has seven million visitors a year. Air service wasn't a real enabler to that. And yet we were sitting with a facility that had been designed around turboprop aircraft coming and going one at a time. And we're looking directly into the airlines transitioning to an all RJ fleet. So now you're, you're faced with how do I tell the story to decision makers, to users, to everyone involved that we need to change, grow uh, our terminal, build a new terminal, and trust us, we're gonna have more air service. We got this. That, that, was, a, that was a hard bridge to build because your, your community is looking at this saying, this airport, this airport isn't vital, and yet you wanna grow and expand it. 
And so foundationally, you have to have trust in people um, that they have, they have the trust in your organization that you're making an informed decision for them uh, with a lot of input from a lot of people that is going to start to move that legacy expectation of you know this, this airport that was struggling into one that can be prosperous and successful. And, and that, that takes a ton of time. I can't emphasize how much time that takes. It's, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a lot of conversations. It's talking to the Rotary Clubs. It's talking to the, um, you know, your electeds. It's talking to your neighbors. I mean, just the influence effect of telling that story again and again and again in different forums. And you start to build that dialogue of here's where we're going. And, and that, in time, changes those expectations. It's a very slow process, but it is possible. You want us all three to take a shot at the same question, or sure. this is going to be very repetitive. These guys are, are already hitting it, and I see, I'm looking out across the room, and I recognize a lot of faces that I personally know, so I already know there's a lot of industry experience in this room, uh, so thank you for listening to us, and, and I'm going to say it in case Bob does it. Feel free to jump in with questions anywhere, because otherwise you might hear a lot of repetitive stuff up here, but... Um, I'm definitely going to sound like a broken record because the questions we've got that I was looking at and we were talking about over breakfast this morning, to me, have a, have a recurring theme. I mean, and, that, and that's everything you're hearing from us up here and uh, what a lot of you already know that's been in this industry for a long time, and that's communicate. Um, I can tell you coming in behind a legacy is not easy. Um, I've, I've recently done that, um, and it's not an easy task at all. Um, there's always opportunity to continue going forward down the field. And, and again, my sports analogy, so forgive me. But, um, I mean, so, you know, you come in and, and, again, you get that assessment of what things are and where they are from the leadership perspective. And then you try to communicate what a vision or a plan might be to try to get that, that mission accomplished. And then, you know, if, if it is different from the legacy that preceded you, that's okay. There's no right or wrong. The legacy that preceded you might have had a perfect plan, and it might have been one way to do it, but as any coach will tell you when they line up on the sideline, there's, there's two different ways to get down the field, or many more. So, I mean, that's, that's the, that same principle applies to us as airport directors, managers, assistant managers, whatever your role may be. <coughs> Once you figure that game plan out, it's, it's then trying to communicate that explain the value or the reasoning behind that, and then try to get buy-in. Because uh, you, can't, you can't win if you don't have buy-in from your team. Um, I, you know, the, the team I walked into right now in Ventura County Airports is an awesome team. I, I'm, I'm dare to say it's one of the best teams I've ever had in my entire 32-year career. I got three members sitting here today, and I'm very thankful that they're elements of my team and leadership um, I lost a critical member who, who, who left to uh, go, go run another system of airports, and it was a, it was a huge loss for us. Um, just outstanding team, and, and that's what you've got to do. You've got to get the buy-in from your team once you figure out what that mission is going to be. And other than just sitting here repeating myself, I'll stop for questions or throw it back to you for another question. Thanks, Kip. I appreciate it. That's a great, great response. Uh, I'm going to shift gears now and how we uh, manage expectations in the environmental world. Um, you know, these emerging issues about uh, climate change, um, emissions from aircraft impacting the health and of the individuals that live around the airports and, and noise issues, it's very complex. These issues aren't easy and they they do rise to the surface periodically, especially when you have an airport in a highly urbanized environment where it has direct impact on the people that live right around the airport. So how do we effectively manage the expectations related to these emerging like health and safety issues that really through social media become much more acute and much more intense because people communicate in ways now that never no one could conceive of 10 years ago, even five years ago. As we all experience, people set up websites, they do sky, you know, all kinds of different social media, and they create false narratives about the airport. 
So how do we manage these emerging expectations? How do we counterbalance sometimes issues that have, have gone off the rails, not for any fault of your own, but through a perception within the community? Mr. Dean? <laughs> I knew I drew a short straw when I came last to this and they had already claimed the end seats. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, Bob's absolutely right. I mean, there are some very big, complex issues out there. Um, and, and I will say it's not necessarily ours to solve, or we don't necessarily have the capability or resources, we as airport managers, to solve them ourselves. And so in, in this case, I, I will lean on the word collaboration. I, I mean, look for help in whatever source you can find it. I mean, at the local level, um, at the state or region or national level, at other people in this room. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, best practices discussed earlier is a good example. I, I mean, you know, I've seen a lot of things, but I haven't seen everything. and so. Conferences like this are a good place to share, and I'm going to share in a moment something with the others that they may not know and, and might be helpful to you. Um, but I think the main driving point here is we, we can provide information, we can do research, we can share, we can, can sit down and talk, but, but a, a, a thing a lot of these issues that are so large that are they're beyond just our capability to control, well, you need help. So seek out help and, and get collaboration. So the one example I was going to bring up, we were talking this morning, because on, on Bob's notes, um, you know, it talks about climate change and water quality, and then he put human trafficking. And, and that resonated with me, and I'll, and I'll share with everyone in the room here, that um, we, we implemented a, a little step forward we're certainly not going to claim to have solved human trafficking, but uh, we, we are doing something at the airport that's relatively new in an effort to try and take one little bite out of that elephant. And uh, we collaborated with two local organizations in our community, uh, the Eddie House and the um, um, Children's Cabinet, which are organizations that work in this field. Um, and then we've also joined with uh, Safe Place, and I think a lot of folks probably have heard of Safe Place, and that's mostly children related, but, but we, by adding the other entities to it, now it's more comprehensive. It's children and battered uh, spouses and, and uh, trafficked uh, individuals and that. And, and it, it may sound small, but it's a start. Um, we've placed signage uh, throughout the entire terminal, and including on every stall in the restroom, with a sign and, and clear language that indicates and a number to call um, that if someone's in need of help, they call that number and it goes through our dispatch and our dispatch will, will send one of our staff to that place, stay with that person until a law enforcement officer can intervene. Um, and if, if they can't, they will track them to wherever they're going in the terminal and identify them later and law enforcement will intervene and if it's a situation that requires separation we have an area that's set aside um, and we also through those other organizations they provide counselors and, and uh, folks that can help take that person from that point on to the next level of, of getting resolution on things so um, we've instituted that program we've done training we've actually worked with AAAE to get a module of the uh, IET training stood up and I think it's available to everyone now. So this is just one small piece of something that we're doing and I'm sure every other airport's doing something on some of these issues that are beneficial to others and so I share that but uh, I'll end my message with repeating collaboration, find help and, and you know, do little steps. Every little step counts. You know, if you can install um, charging stations for GSE equipment, uh, you know, it's now coming to our airport uh, down to our level where the airlines are looking to uh, bring electric GSE equipment. It's just the little stuff. But then lastly, celebrate it. When you do something like that, you do something good, let people know about it. 
tell the community that this exists, celebrate it. So I'll end with that. So I'll pick up where, where Dean left off on the, the telling the community about it. Um, I think as a small airport, that can be probably the most important piece and, and maybe even the hardest to do at times because we don't have uh, in-house communication staff, PR, marketing, and whatnot. We, we work with outside services for that. Um, but but it, it, it's critically important. Uh, we had the pleasure over the last few years of going through uh, a TCE groundwater investigation, um, which has wrapped up just about the time to start PFAS. So I, I kind of felt like we got to, you know, we got through the uh, the playoffs to now get to the big game, and um, and as a part of that, you know, we it was it was um, it was decided early on in that TC investigation that we wanted it to be uh, very open and available to the media and the public uh, as the process was unfolding. Invite media out for when we're doing sampling, when we're doing drilling, offer the interviews, help people understand the process as it's evolving, rather than just seeing these point in time. Uh, pieces of information about something that can cause concern when taken in um, without the context of, of the bigger issue. That also gave us a chance to continue the conversation with media about the complexity of these issues, of which you know the airport is certainly a piece of it, but it's a much bigger issue, particularly when you look at PFAS and all the other potential sources un unrelated to airports and how I think in the coming years we're, we're all going to see that in different parts of our communities. So uh, working with the media is critically important. And I think understanding in this, are you as the airport starting from a place of trust with your community? If you had to measure that on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being your, your, your uh, highly trusted institution, and you know, 1 is nobody would you know, drive onto your property without being concerned, uh, where, where is your trust rating with your community? And I think if, if you're constantly assessing that, you're going to have a better idea of how to position yourself and your story going into these things because uh, there, there's complexity to all the issues Bob laid out here that go well beyond airports and aviation. But if your community trusts you and your airport and your team that you're going to do the right thing for the airport and the community um, with these tough issues, many of which don't start or end at the airport, you're, you're going to come out of it in a better way. So the actions you're taking in places completely unrelated to these things can have a huge bearing on how the community will see your efforts on, on some of these stickier issues. I don't, I don't think there's anything I can add. That was well said. Thank you, Kip. <laughs> Thank you all. So I'm going to shift gears again. We have a question over here. Test, test, okay. Um, I just want to touch on something because uh, I think Dean said something very interesting uh, in his little thing. He said uh, that uh, he talked about the lack of capability to do things. And when I've encountered this and many, many times interacting with the public, it's often the things that I can't do, that I can't change. You know, as I'm not the FAA. I'm not the airlines, I'm not the FBOs. I don't necessarily control who uses the airport, why, how many aircraft. And so I was just wondering, you know, how do you manage the expectations of the public for the things that you cannot change as an airport operator? I think that's one of your questions later on here, but uh, <laughs> Cooper Cooper's taking us off script here, so um, that's that is a very difficult issue to deal with, um, and and I and I don't have a magic bullet for you, so I, I mean I'll start <laughs> with managing your expectations of my response. Uh, Kevin and Kip may have better responses, but uh, I, I mean education is number one. Take the time, you know, and, and do your level best to try and provide as much information and explanation so there's clarity of what you can do and what others are, uh, have placed upon you as uh, limitations or responsibilities. Um, if the other factions that are influencing that are willing to, to step up, uh, 
that's great. I'll, and I'll give an example. Our, our tower manager, when we have a uh, noise complaint, um, if, you know, it'll be our job to take that on first and see if we can and, um, um, address that issue. But if not, our tower manager has frequently attended uh, meetings in people's homes um, and we brought them to the tower. And, and so if you can have that, that relationship with those other entities, kind of what Kevin was talking about, you know, to, to bring a more fuller picture, um, sometimes it resolves the issue, um, sometimes it doesn't. And I don't have an answer for the doesn't, but, you know, I would say just keep doing your best to try and provide that person with information as best you can and, and, and go from there. It's, it's probably the, the core of what is one of the single hardest parts of our sports uh, because, you know, we, we own the property and some of the facilities, but all the magic that happens out there, for the most part, isn't the airport. But what the customer sees, well, that's the airport. And what they want to talk about, well, that's the airport. So it's, it's, a, it's the, the crux of the whole challenge. And I think, um, it, depending on what line of business you're talking about, whether it's kind of noise and environment or airlines, there's, there's different things we do in all those. But one, I think, that has been uh, very effective and was very simple for us to do uh, in our terminal when we opened, we, um, we had the benefit of a, a new Wi-Fi network. And we were able to put a splash page on it that allowed us to have a survey, answer a few questions, and enjoy your free Wi-Fi. So we uh, have been perpetually asking questions of our users, pretty basic stuff um, that change from time to time. But then we have that other, tell us what you think box. And that, that's often very interesting to hear what people will put in there. So we, we gather this information, and then on a monthly basis, that is distributed to all of the key stakeholders in the building, TSA, rental cars, airlines, the whole crew. Everybody sees that. And, and if there is stuff happening in there that we see some consistency in, we can have a more focused conversation on it. But, you know, I can't control that, you know, it's going to take them 19 minutes to get the bags to the, to the bag carousel. But you know what? If the customers are complaining about that and they don't know about it, well, what I could have done was help the understanding start to develop. So uh, a as an airport, we're likely never going to directly control everything, as cool as that would be when you think about it, but it won't happen. Um, but at the same time, we can be this conduit of information and sharing and helping our stakeholders and tenants help them find a way to do things that will improve the outcome. So with, you know, with airline operations, that's a bit different than, say, with unhappy people about planes over their house and, and all the complexities of airspace and noise. A very different area and, and some different strategies that you would use there. But it's, it's a key challenge and one that I, I don't see getting any easier as our business tends to get more dynamic. Thanks, Kevin. I'd like to dovetail in on that also. Um, again, in 17 years of being at Santa Monica, I dealt with a lot of expectations especially from the public. And one thing, uh, my sage advice to all of you is, tell people what they need to hear. Don't tell people what they want to hear. You start telling people what they want to hear and you don't say the same thing to everybody, you will get in a world of hurt in a big, big way. So it's hard sometimes to tell people, I'm not jurisdictionally responsible for the emissions from this aircraft. And they'll say, why not? Well, the US EPA says I'm not. So you have to have good sources and good methods, but you don't want to tell people what they want to hear all the time. You want to be there. You, you have to be the bad guy sometimes. You have to be the guy that says no. Uh, I'll leave with this one small story. With homes 300 feet from the end of a runway and 18,000 jet operations, emissions rose to the top of the heap of complaints at the end of my runway the departure ramp. Everybody said, oh, you're killing me with the emissions. The airport's killing me with the emissions. We actually went to the EPA and said, can you run an, an air quality analysis off the end of our runway? The city didn't do it, the EPA did it. And they came back with their data and said that these people weren't adversely affected from a health perspective, right? Yeah, it sucked to smell the jet fuel and the jet fumes and the, all the other stuff, but it wasn't a health issue. 
it wasn't us that said it, it was the EPA that said it. And that created a, di a dynamic that shifted the, narr the narrative between, from the city to the actual agency that had jurisdictional responsibility for the emissions of aircraft. So that's my story. Chip, you want to jump in at all? Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, I, I just want to make sure I understood the question. Managing public expectation? I mean, is that okay? I mean, you know, the, the way I, I guess the way I look at it is, uh, you know, most of the airports I've run have been enterprise funds. So the public is my customer uh, in some shape, fashion, or form. I grew up in a very small uh, business. My dad was an entrepreneur. Uh, so I grew up in a small business environment where I learned the customer is always right, <laughs> whether they are or not. Um, the each dollar meant something. So for me, I make sure to try to incorporate those customer expectations. And that's and, and I'm running a business. So, uh, you know, if, if and, and Bob's right. You can't you can't make them all happy. Um, uh, all you can do is you can try to find that happy medium somewhere, or, or maybe even above that, hopefully. Uh, and then and then really good education oftentimes will help when you can't satisfy those other uh, public expectations that maybe just weren't realistic. Um, you know, we 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 want to fly to whatever, you know, and it just doesn't make any sense when you look at your market study to put a flight into a certain destination. Just using that as an example. It doesn't make sense to go chase that. It, you lose your credibility with airlines. You lose your credibility with everything. So you have to make good common sense decisions, but at the same token, you can listen, you can you can explain, you can educate, and, and that's, that's what we try to do. Uh, when we can't meet an expectation, we try to educate while we can't. We make sure we listen first, and then we make sure we, uh, if it's something we can go try to do, we try to have an open mind and do it, uh, or at least look at it. But if not, then if it doesn't make sense for the organization as a whole, then you know we try to educate why we couldn't do that. One other um, approach we took to that, and it's still in existence today in Truckee, we started an airport community advisory team that uh, that invited those that were unhappy or or um, affected by the situation to help solve the problem in a in an organized forum, and and what's interesting in that process is people quickly step into the tent of of aviation complexity, and and they um, are changed in that process of seeing the challenges we deal with when they're brought to the table to have some accountability to help solve the problem. They start to move from being someone who's just unhappy to now somebody who's maybe frustrated but appreciative of the complexity to ultimately being a champion for the airport. And, and that's, that's a pretty amazing thing to watch. Um, that, that's hugely valuable for, for what input that takes from the airport to create and run that process. Uh, and they exist in all forms. You know, San Francisco has a round table. It, it's big airports, it's small airports. It isn't necessarily relevant to just one size or category of airport, but for an airport that has really uh, thorny problems, it, it is a great way to engage people in the discussion in an organized way that they have to take some ownership for it. Good point. We have about seven minutes to go. This topic is so wide ranging. I'd like to close. If there are any other questions in the audience, then I would like to transition to one small little element of expectations, and that is tenant expectations. I think we've all experienced expectations from tenants at our airports. Uh, so how would you work with hangar tenants on and off airport businesses that may have requests and expectations that are very difficult to meet? How do you deal with the tenants on that? Kip, you want to start? So I'm, founding, I'm sounding very repetitive here, but it's the same thing. This whole this whole panel of discussion is the same same messaging. Nothing nothing's different for the tenants. So for me, it goes back to what I was just talking about a moment ago. Great question, by the way. Thank you for asking it. It was actually one of ours. <laughs> so I appreciate you bringing it out. Um, but you know, tenants is, is an element of that. Tenants are our business. I mean, they're they're our customers. So we want to make sure that we're first listening. I mean, we want to listen as 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 much as you know, I've found a lot of times uh, doing this 30-something years that just getting out on the field and, and, and spending time with tenants is and letting them vent about whatever it is, whether it makes sense or not, uh, it, that has gone so far for me. I mean, I'll, I'll get calls like, 
thank you for listening. Thank you for caring. I'm like, well, you know, I really didn't do anything. But, <laughs> and, uh, but you know, just listening. Uh, a lot of times that goes a long way, just listening. Um, and be open, as I said a minute ago. So if they've got ideas about something, whether it's uh, leases, whatever it is, it, it doesn't hurt to explore the possibility. I mean, it doesn't have to be so, so regimented that we can't explore out-of-the-box ideas and, and possibilities. And if that's something for your airport that makes it a more competitive airport, because airports compete. I mean, it's businesses that compete. So if that, if that makes us a more competitive airport, then we try to do that. We try to listen and be creative and think outside the box a little bit. Uh, try to be positive. Um, just a lot of times that goes a long ways, just trying to be positive and, and give positive feedback, thank them for their participation, thank them for their interest. They have a, a valuable interest in your airport. They, they care about, it may be their selfish reasons they care, uh, maybe not. Maybe they've got other interests that go with that as well. Um, you know, uh, the hardest thing is sometimes to check our emotions at the door because um, you got tenants that are all riled up. They've been riled up for 10 years about an issue. And you, you walk in and, and all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, let's talk about it. You know, we, <laughs> we can figure this thing out. So just, you know, check the emotions at the door. It's no different than if you're on the 101 and somebody cuts you off and, you know, you, you got all these first emotions that you want to give them and, and then it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> they're heading to the hospital or something. Just give it the benefit of the doubt, right? Um, and, then, and then just be consistent. Uh, for me, has, is, is what I see as a recipe for possibly success, um, trying to be consistent. So don't, don't do it for one tenant that you don't do for another, and don't be um, one way that you're going to not be for the, entire, for the entire crew. So if it's something that's policy-wise that you're going to implement at your airport that uh, is tenant-driven, thought and maybe something beneficial after you've researched it and put it into play, just make sure it's consistent for all. Of course, we're required to do that anyway, so that's not a, that's not a stretch for any of us in this room with FAA ground assurances. But the point is, uh, it's just common practice in that kind of thing. So that's, that's, I try to break it down and keep it simple. Uh, what is that, K-I-S-S? -S? Yeah, that's, that's my best philosophy. So. Well said. Um, you know, the, the tenant population on our airport is, is um, organized under associations of hangars. So we as the airport have a tenant, the, the association, and then the occupants of all those hangars uh, that have been condominiumized are, are not our tenant per se. Um, it creates a simplicity of administration, but it can create a complexity of roles, responsibilities, and expectations because uh, for instance, the pavement in front of their hangar is theirs. It's not ours. It's on their lease site. They're under a master ground lease. And so they are, um, they are having to work as a team <laughs> to create some peace in their own neighborhoods, which I think is interesting to watch at times. But at the same time, we, we as the airport evolve these relationships with the individual tenants because they're the users of the airport. But it's a bit of a different relationship um, than airports that maybe have built hangars one at a time. Uh, I can't say it's any better or worse. I've, I've lived under all sorts of different arrangements. It's just a bit of a unique beast when a majority of our tenants are in these, these association-based developments. And so, you know, to Kip's point of then, you know, your engagement with them, it definitely will start to put some parameters on the kind of expectations we need to maintain because we as the airport are not responsible for things right up, you know, to the front door, even within the building. We only have 65 hangars that we lease individually on the airport. So a bit of a different construct there. I think that the primary thing, and I, I keep coming back to trust, is that, you know, whether it's the public or your tenants, is the airport starting from a place of trust in those conversations? And, and ask yourself that before you go into a meeting. Am I meeting with someone who, who has uh, a trusted relationship with us, or are they coming in you know, very uh, locked and loaded from previous engagements or, or a history of mistrust with the airport? And, and that's going to set the tone for how that conversation goes. Uh, we had a wonderful meeting here recently, tenant meeting, and we had we had one outlier in the group, and and that can that can take the conversation in a very different direction when you have one person who who doesn't understand or doesn't trust the airport and and others that do. So there, there's no simple answers to any of this, but but I think really taking that time to think about you know what is the trust level we're starting with in this meeting and how is that going to shape the conversation. 
real quick, um, tee off of the trust issue, I'll give an example. We recently just did a rates and charges study and, and uh, we had significant help from uh, very good experts in that area, but, uh, but on the trust side, it, you know, we did two things from the very outset. We said exactly what we were gonna do and how we were gonna do it, and, and we invited uh, all stakeholders to be on that. We had one of our board trustees, we had representatives from the general aviation community, and then we had staff on that committee was that was running that study, and we said, this is how we're gonna do it, and this is, you know, the steps, and we followed through with that, and end of the day, I'm not gonna say everybody was happy and singing kumbaya together, there was still people that wanted rent reductions and, and deeper rent reductions, but, but by bringing people in early and, and agreeing to the process, there was a level of trust built that we, we, we did what we said we were gonna do regardless of how the outcome. And I will say, some, some hangar rents went down. So, but, and we adopted those and, and moved forward. But I just wanted to follow up on that. Uh, I, you know, I can't emphasize enough to build that trust is, is be consistent and, and do what you say you're gonna do and, and be upfront with, with it and inclusive of adding stakeholders. Well, that brings us to the close of this session. Are there any questions that anyone else has uh, thought about in the audience you'd like to discuss real quick? Or is everybody ready to run off to the cannery row and get some lunch? <laughs> Looks like that is the case. So let's give our, our panel a great round of applause. I hope it was helpful. I'll leave you with this thought. When you have tenant meetings, bring pizza. <laughs> Costco pizza. It works. Well, a few housekeeping items before you all take off. The students, uh, the luncheon is over at Cooper Pub. I believe that they're meeting out here in the lobby. So those, it was an invite only. Make sure you get those. And then we wanted to do a raffle real quick for a gift certificate to the spa, $50 for upstairs. And so you got to be present to win. <laughs> Jesus Tomeo. Is Jesus here? Oh, must be present. Hello, <laughs> back in. Jerry Martinez. I think it's another student. Oh, he's, Jerry's here. We will meet you back here at 1.30 is when the next session starts, 1.30.